Hello everyone. Today we're starting on a section uh, called Rutherford's model. Where we'll be learning about uh, the specifics of the model of the atom created by Ernest Rutherford. We can see that it's starting to look uh, pretty similar to sort of the typical idea in our head that we have of atoms today. So let's learn about it in more detail. So first, a bit about alpha radiation. At the beginning of the 20th century, this fellow here, a New Zealander named Ernest Rutherford, who you might recognize from the New Zealand $100 note, uh, was studying radiation. He discovered that one type of radiation called alpha radiation consisted of uh, lots of little particles. So uh, he called those uh, alpha particles, because of course they came from alpha radiation. So he decided to use these alpha particles to investigate the properties of atoms. So you've got some small particles, you've got atoms with your other small particles. Presumably you can shoot one sort of small particle at the other to sort of see what happens. And that's exactly what Rutherford did, or what he asked his friends to do. So uh, he asked uh, Hans Geiger, whose name is remembered in the Geiger counter, uh, and Geiger student uh, Ernest Marsden, to uh, make an experiment that would bombard uh, atoms with alpha particles. So this experiment, due to the people who first did it, is called the Geiger-Marsden experiment. And so uh, the 1909 experiment measured the deflection of alpha particles by atoms. And we can see the setup that they used over here. We have an alpha particle source and a slit to make sure that they're all going in the same direction. Uh, when it gets to this point in the apparatus, it hits a metal foil made of a very, very, very thinly beaten metal, like gold or something like that, and then a screen to detect where the particles went after they hit the foil. So the particles will, after going through the slit, uh, presumably they'll interact with the metal foil in some way, and then get knocked out and hit the screen where they can be detected. So the plum pointing model suggested that alpha particles should undergo a little bit of deflection. This sort of be deflected in one way a little bit, or one way in, a, in another bit. So what did the experiment show? Geiger's experiment uh, showed this result here. And as we can see, there are many particles that aren't deflected. It's this blue line over here that shows how it changes when the foil is put in. So there are lots of particles that weren't deflected at all. But most of them were deflected by a little bit, which is OK. But a small number were deflected by huge amounts. In fact, when Rutherford moved the screen around, in, uh, or maybe it was Geiger or Marsden, when they moved the screen around in the apparatus, they noticed that some of the alpha particles were almost bouncing backwards uh, the way they came, which is something you would never expect to happen uh, for the um, plum pudding model. So the result was extremely surprising. We have a Surprise picture of Rutherford over here. And in fact, uh, this uh, led to one of my favorite quotes in physics. Rutherford uh, said it, it was almost as incredible as if you would find a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it had bounced back. It's completely unexpected and out of the blue. And so obviously, you've got to make some changes to your atomic model in order to explain this amazing result. And so that's e exactly what uh, Rutherford did. So Rutherford's analysis of the data suggested that the atoms have a very small, very dense, positively charged nucleus. Uh, so here's the original sort of plum pudding model, which had lots of electrons embedded inside a sphere. And here's Rutherford's model, where we have one tiny little dense bit, a nucleus, right in the middle of the atom. And it, it would explain why the alpha particles were sometimes deflected almost straight backwards. So this means that atoms consist mostly of empty space, which is this sort of blue circle around the nucleus. Uh, and almost all of an atom's mass, uh, something like 99.999 and so on percent of it, is sort of concentrated right at the nucleus. There's almost nothing in the rest of the atom. So in 1911, Rutherford uh, sort of published a model which explained his findings. So he suggested that the electrons were orbiting a positive nucleus, which we can see over here. Uh, the centripetal force to keep them in orbit was provided by electrostatic attraction, because as we know, negative charged particles are attracted to positively charged particles. 
And so in some aspects, it was a little bit like a solar system with the sun in the middle and the planets going around. So the atomic number of the atom was the positive charge uh, on the nucleus. And this was a great sort of uh, step forward that Rutherford's model made because uh, it, it couldn't really be explained very well by other models. So it means that for carbon, for example, which has an atomic number of six, that will be the positive charge on the nucleus here. And so to make the atom neutral, you would also have six electrons orbiting the nucleus. So Rutherford's model had a few problems, which I'll go into now. We can see a diagram of one of them over here, in fact. And the thing is, accelerating charges radiate energy. And this is a known fact of uh, accelerating charges. So the electrons should be losing energy and slowing down as they're sort of moving in a circle. And because they're slowing down, it means that they would get closer to the nucleus, and eventually they'd sort of spiral all the way in and smash into the nucleus, and the atom would be destroyed. As we know, that doesn't happen, so this model can't be completely right. The model also couldn't explain the spectrum of different elements. A spectrum is a series of glowing lines that's uh, produced by an element when it's heated up. We learned a little bit about that in uh, module four, which was from ideas to implementation. So there are a few other unanswered questions of Rutherford's model. So what makes an atomic nucleus of different elements different? We know that some heavy elements have a nucleus that's or an atom that's much, much heavier than their atomic number. And this model couldn't really explain that. Uh, there's nothing to stop the electrons from losing energy. Uh, we don't know how the electrons are arranged around the nucleus. Are they all orbiting at the same distance? Or are they all orbiting at different distances? If they're different distances, what makes them different? If they're the same, what stops them from crashing into each other? So it, it wasn't a perfect model. So Rutherford's model was a step forward. It's a big step forward over the plum pudding model because it's uh, more similar to our current model than J.J. Uh, Thompson's model. But it still couldn't explain the atom adequately. It, it was missing details. This is because it used classical principles to describe the atom, so things like continuous energy loss and that sort of thing. But classical physics aren't the only sort of physics that we've learned about. If you remember back in From Ideas to Implementation, you would have remembered a little bit about quantum physics. And so, in fact, quantum theory can be used to create uh, an atomic model that describes the way atoms behave better than Rutherford's classical model, which had orbiting electrons. So that's the end of the theory. Today we've learned about uh, Rutherford's experiment on atoms and how he was able to explain the surprising results. Let's go on to some questions. Question six, part A. Calculate the density of an atomic nucleus given that it has this radius and this mass. Now what's density? It's the amount of mass in a volume, right? So if something is very dense, then it's very small and heavy. All right, so if we have a radius of an atomic nucleus, uh, how do we find its volume? Well, we assume it's a sphere, that's how. So assuming the nucleus is spherical, the volume of a sphere is given by this formula here, 4 thirds pi r cubed, which of course we know from mathematics. Um, so substituting in our value for the radius, we can uh, have this expression for the total volume of the nucleus. So putting that into a calculator, we end up with 3.35 times 10 to the minus 44 meters cubed which is pretty tiny, as you might have noticed. All right, so now we have the volume. Uh, getting density is pretty simple. All we have to do is take the mass and divide it by the volume, right? So uh, density is mass over volume. Substitute mass in, sorry, mass in for there and uh, the volume that we achieved for the volume. Uh, so our expression will look something like this. Mass on top, volume at the bottom. So we can put that into a calculator to find the density. And that ends up being uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic meter, which is enormous. That's a 1.5 with 16 zeros after it. 
that's you know trillions. That's an incredibly high number. So it's it's very very dense and much denser than any sort of normal substance that we see at our scale. So part B. Given the nuclear density, compare it with the density of lead, which has a density of uh, 1.1 times 10 to the 4 kilograms per cubic meter, and comment on the amount of empty space in the Rutherford model. So as we know, lead is a pretty dense element compared to some other elements. Uh, in fact, if we have a cubic meter of it, it weighs, you know, 10 tons. Um, but we can see that the nuclear density is much, much higher. So the nucleus is in fact 10 to the 13 times more dense than lead. Uh, that ends up being something like 10 trillion times as dense. And a trillion is a mind-bogglingly huge number, let alone 10 trillion. So what can we say about the two different densities? <laughs> well, for atoms to be this much less dense than the nucleus, because of course lead is made up of atoms, then the vast majority of the atom must be empty space. So the atom as a whole has about this density, uh, despite the fact that the nucleus has this density. So for that to happen, most of the atom must weigh pretty much nothing. Question 7. Outline the main features of the Rutherford model of the atom. Alright, well let's think about some of the features here. We have a dot in the middle and things going round, right? So Rutherford suggested a model of the atom in which negative electrons orbited a tiny, very dense, very heavy, compared to the electrons, positively charged nucleus. So the electrostatic force between the electrons and the nucleus is what was causing it to move in the circle around the nucleus. So it's a little like planets orbiting a sun in a solar system. So almost all the mass of the atom, a uh, you know, huge amount of it, uh, was concentrated right in the nucleus with almost no mass uh, contributed by the surrounding electrons. Remember, it was a very, very long time before electrons were determined to have mass at all. So that would explain uh, why they seem so light in this model. Part B. Describe some of the Rutherford model's limitations. So obviously it's a better model than the previous models, but it's still not perfect. A few of the imperfections are as follows. As soon as this will come up there. So Rutherford's model was unstable because an orbiting electron should be losing energy. If it's losing energy due to emitting electromagnetic waves, it would spiral into the nucleus and be destroyed. And we know that, that doesn't happen, so the model's not right. Uh, his model also failed to exp uh, explain atomic uh, spectrum, spectra rather, so emission spectra and absorption spectra. There are other later models of the atom which were able to explain this, but we'll get onto that in the next section. Question 8. Oh, multiple choice. Fantastic. Which diagram best illustrates Rutherford's model of the atom? So if we think about this a bit, we have something in the middle in each case and something orbiting it. So in B and D we have a neutral middle and that's not really right. In D we have a positive charge orbiting a negative charge, which isn't right either. In fact, the correct answer is of course A. We have negatively charged electrons orbiting a positively charged, very dense nucleus. Question 9. Why was gold foil used in alpha particle scattering experiments? Well, all of these are properties of gold, but only one of them is sort of useful for this sort of experiment. So conductor, oh, we don't need to worry about conducting. Its surface does not corrode in a vacuum, but we don't really need to deal with that much of a vacuum. Uh, it does not oxidize when exposed to air. We're not really worrying about air here. Our last option is it's nuclear heavy and it can be beaten into very thin sheets. Hang on. Very thin sheets. If we only want to deflect the alpha particles and not block them completely, then this is a very important property of the gold foil. It also has uh, heavy atoms, which would be useful if you're measuring deflection. And so, of course, our answer here is that uh, because we can't use thick foil and because we need heavy atoms, uh, we can use this property of gold atoms to use them in the alpha scattering experiment. So C is the correct answer.
Question 10. Identify x, y, z, and w. So we have x over here, y, z, and w. Let's start with x. x is pointing to this little blue circle that's around these uh, even smaller red circles. So if we think of Rutherford's model of the atom, we've got a positively charged nucleus in the middle and a negatively charged electron going around. So in that case, this x would correspond to the negatively charged electron going around. So x is an electron. All right, what about y? y is pointing to the little red dot right in the middle. So it's this part here. We know from our uh, the fact that it's an experiment using gold foil that this must be the nucleus of one of the gold atoms. So y is a gold nucleus. All right, what about Z and W? So Z is just a line coming from left that's gone straight through without being deflected at all. So what exactly are we trying to measure the deflection of in this experiment? It must be alpha particles. That's right, because we were using alpha radiation to fire at the gold foil. So Z must be an alpha particle. But we have one more, W. And it looks pretty similar to Z, except that it's being bent away by hitting the foil. So once again, this is an alpha particle, but this one has been deflected by one of the gold nuclei in the experiment. Well, that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've gone through uh, Rutherford's model of the atom, the fact that there's a very heavy nucleus surrounded by uh, electrons sort of orbiting around it, and we've also gone through some of the limitations, the fact that it couldn't explain various properties of the atoms or the spectral lines. But we'll learn a bit more about how to explain those in the next section. Mm -hmm.